everybody welcome back to keith and mike watch deep space nine today we are talking about season two episode 21 the maquis part two now we're 21 episodes into a season that's almost twice uh what most uh, uh shows are today but we're not even all the way through season two we have a bunch more episodes how's it going mike i'm gonna replace that yeah yeah <laughs> If only I had turned on my AI so you couldn't tell I was looking down. <laughs> uh -huh. That's a, we're going to talk about the AI eyeballs on our next Geekly, and it's going to creep you out. It's creepy and cool. Uh, fly, Eagles, fly, Keith. Uh, Mike nailed it. Nailed it on the prediction. Uh, but you know what? I'm not going to talk the S because the your New York football giants had a great season and uh, lots lots to be excited about. Uh, but that's yeah, no. Oh, go ahead. Go you, ahead. You know, like it, your team was vastly more talented and deeper than than we were. So of course you won, and I, I don't begrudge you. I have a lot of Eagle fans in law, uh, so I I have I have. Uh, a different flavor of burning hatred than I used to in mm -hmm. uh, in middle school. Uh, so uh, I can right. appreciate. I, I like a good squad. I like a good story. I like a good team to root for. The Giants, you know, we we, we share a passion in hating the Cowboys. They got what they deserved. That's true. Uh, uh, but I like a good story, and there's good guys on both of these football teams. So there's there's yes. there's a lot to, to to root for. And guess what? Same with the 49ers. So I'm 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 pretty excited about what's happening in the NFC. Uh, go NFC. We won't talk football here. We have another show for that kind of thing. Keith, I'm we excited this do. week because uh, any two-parter, you know the second part's generally going to probably be better in the TV because that's when all the action happens. We get the pew-pews. We get some yeah. great buddy copying this episode. I, I'm i excited to talk about it, so let's jump in. I'm excited to talk about it, uh, especially after the sort of underwhelming part one there was. Oh, oh, I'm just yodeling into the sky. Wow. <laughs> Frozen. That was weird. I, I don't know what that was. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, so after this sort of underwhelming part one, I, I was interested to go back and watch part two again. And I was like, oh, OK, cool. So we're going to talk all about that. Uh, but before we do that, we have some important people to thank, we Mike. Do. They and are our is, patrons. Yeah. Uh, those who are with us currently, those of uh, us who aren't with us anymore. Who uh, are paid through the end of the month. Oh, you're right. You're right. Uh, we appreciate you all. We we understand that uh, we never want you to contribute if you if it is by any means causes you any financial hardship. I know that it is tough in these times. So we thank with all of our heart and soul Brian Kaufman, Casey Clark, Cloud Lover Six Nine, Jason Mo, Andrew Hayes, Jorge Navoa, and the mysterious mysterious woofs 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 <laughs> woofs boot shivs woofs butthole so <laughs> otherwise known as woofs boot shivs. Oh man, CRM. Woof, there it is. Prod. Charles Babajidge, uh, Nikolay Ivanovich Lobachevsky at Grim Toys, Delusions at Noon, and Eric Wilson. We thank you. You can join the team at patreon.com slash KM. You had all kinds of good stuff. You'd know. Uh, Keith, our mm. boy JD over on YouTube gave one of the yes. best compliments of our new uh, Let's Play series that's slowly dripping, IV dripping onto YouTube, but is almost slowly all. Slowly dripping? You are literally just try. I'm you're, I'm trying to hold back the once fire Once a week, I'm putting that it out. Mine. Once a week on the YouTube, uh -huh. but our patrons are getting it deluged in the face. Oh my God. JD goes, hey, I can say without, uh, whatever, this, there's no one putting content like this on the internet. And Keith, I'm not sure he meant it as the compliment I took it as, but regardless, I took I it. I a million percent take it as a compliment, even if he didn't mean it that way. No one... Yeah, so uh, if if you're if you're not seeing this, uh, it, on, it, go check the feed. Mike and I are doing a full playthrough of Star Trek, the something something. What is Star it? Trek: The Next Generation, a final unity. Final Unity, 1995 CD-ROM point and click game, and uh, it's really quite something. And uh, we're bad. Yeah, we, we we basically started hitting the beer while we're doing it, and 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 uh, I, I promise I'm going to keep Mike from talking over the dialogue uh, constantly. But it is absolute chaos, and it's a musical now. Uh, so check it out in our feed. And while you're at it, check out the uh, you know the Star Trek toy show. Everybody knows about the flagship Star Trek toy show, but also check out KM Geekly where we talk about other stuff uh, even more than we do here, which is kind of astounding. 
All right. Well, enough of that. Let's talk about Deep Space Nine, Season 2, Episode 21, The McKee Part 2, which aired on May 1st, 1994. I was coming up on my 14th birthday. Ooh, it's a big one. A uh, big one, sort of. I mean, freshman year of high school, almost. So this important. would have been the end of eighth grade, I guess, the beginning of, yeah, end of eighth grade for me. Uh, anyway. That's when you had so that, the, you had an opportunity to be cool, Keith. I don't know if you if you nailed it or if you let it slide, but you had a Mike, shot. I do, uh, I do six YouTube shows about Star Trek. Any guesses on whether or not I nailed it? <laughs> well, uh, you were just ahead of your time, buddy. Uh, I was behind a lot of things, though. I don't think my voice had changed yet. So uh, I'm not sure it's I'm not sure it has now. We were listening to uh once again R. Kelly's bump and grind. <clears throat> Problematic singers. Um, R. Kelly, I hope you get bump and shivved. There you go. Okay. Well, fair enough. The top movie, uh, I did not remember this movie at all, but I really uh felt the description of this was. Whew, you ready for this? Choice? Mike? Yeah, give it to me. The uh, the top movie was a movie called No Escape, a Ray Liotta dystopian prison escape movie. Okay. And, and get ready for it. Set in 2022, when inconceivably, mm -hmm. which would never happen, mm -hmm. uh, prisons are run by corporations for profit, and the prisoners are seen as assets. Okay. Yeah. Well, at that's least, yeah. Definitely didn't happen. No, it, no. It's a documentary, apparently. So okay, whew, that was meant to be good old Ray Liotta. What'd you call him? Ray Liotta. Yeah, that's what you wanted to say. It's not what you said, though. I'm saucy uh, today. Say, Sorry. Yeah. You are. Jeez. Uh, Ray Liotta once asked me for directions. I thought you were nice gonna guy. say, you know, uh, well, me and Jim were just talking about this time that uh, Tony Danza asked me <laughs> to have a drink. That's true. I turned it yeah, down because yeah. I had a date with my wife. Yeah, well, and, and every time you bring that up, I have to just give my props. Uh, you once asked Natalie Portman out. I did. I mean, it was this a hard no. But you, <laughs> she said no, politely. Politely. But you asked. I did. I mean, hats off, sir. Hats off. All right. Why, what, what are we talking about? No we, idea. We're lost. Keith, you want to know what was All on right, TV? Well, Let's stay on topic and talk about other TV shows. Yeah, uh, nothing exciting on the on the on the TV this night. But I will point out that uh, Hallmark Hall of Fame had a, a show on ABC. That's before Hallmark had its own channel. So every once in a while, you got mm -hmm. that Hallmark movie. It was on ABC. Yeah, and it yeah. was called A Place for Anne. Oh, huh. which where is Anne's place? Uh, I don't know. It was on Hallmark. Apparently, the CBS was it, was it about a mysterious Anne? That that's a mystery, Keith. I don't know. I mean, was was mysterious and even alive in 1994? Who knows? We don't know much about her. We know no, much about she's her. Mysterious. CBS Sunday Night Movie was the oldest living Confederate widow tells all, part one of two. So uh, set your DVRs, I guess. Not that uh -huh. that was a thing. The DVR, set your VHSs, set your Panasonic Keith, but that's, VHS. If you were in the Sunday market, but what about if you were watching on Saturday? Ah, uh, uh, the commish was all new. The letter of the law. The ABC Saturday night. The movies was playing the jerk. Oh my god, love that movie. Uh, God, he, Steve Martin's just so good. Uh, we had cops, and then the NBC movie of the week. Keith, true to your heart, mm. Tanya and Nancy, <gasps> the inside story. The night they made for TV movie, nineteen ninety four. Yes, while wow, the the like sprung into production ten minutes after the Olympics. Wow, I bet that was good. Uh, I Tonya was great. It was, uh, and and that was, the, and of course, it's probably just like this hit piece on Tonya Harding without having any like empathy for her experience. Whatever. We had a uh, uh, was it a band at that time, Keith? And there was uh, SpaceX we, Mafia. Yeah, uh, sure. Space, Space Eight Apes? Mafia. Yep. Okay. But not the letter, not the number eight, the word eight, which. It never made any sense. But anyway, there was a song we had, and I forget what it was called, but there was a lyric, Jeff Galulu, Jeff, Jeff, Jeff Galuli, Jeff, Jeff Galuli, get a lead pipe, hit a skater in her something knee. It rhymed with ooh, in her like shoe <laughs> knee or something. I don't remember. But it was it was funny. I laughed every time. In we her were, you know, knee? Yeah we, yeah, we were in middle school. Wow. Wow. Okay. Well, hey, you know, I've... Uh... I, I can't criticize worse. anyone's bad <laughs> early lyrics because I've got a few. I got a few bad early lyrics. All right. Let that us. That wasn't good. Uh, 
<laughs> that enough was of this nonsense. Enough, enough of this nonsense. Let's get to the hard-hitting weekly world news headline for May 1st, 1994. There's a Kansas woman addicted to peas. She eats them, gal, it says. Gal eats them for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I'm hooked just like a smoker, boozer, or dope fiend. What about down here? Puppy puppy mailed mailed to animal shelter. It's just too sad. Why do you bring up the sad ones? Uh, Wearing red is against the law. Okay, good. Yeah, I mean, honestly, that's probably the healthiest thing. Uh, I, if I could be addicted to peas, yeah, that would be great. Yeah, I got, I got to figure out how to get that addiction. Peas, peas—they right. make you smart. It's better than beans, which make you fart. Thanks, which thanks, is, uh, which is not a thing, but um, <laughs> now it is. So wow. you're welcome, America. Wow, all <laughs> of that creativity and talent, and that's what you come up with. Yeah. I like it. I'm okay, right, I'm okay so, with it, actually. I'm, I'm, no, I, I, I'm, I, I'm fine with it. I, I have, if you, if you, folks, if you are, uh, uh, if you care to type into your Google box, box or on the YouTubes, uh, you might find not one, but two songs composed by me uh, about farts. So, uh, so there you go. All right. So uh, this episode. Keith, what's the difference between an Old West saloon and an elephant's fart. I can't tell you. Um, One is a bar room, and the other is a bar room. Bar room! What? One, you know, so an Old West saloon is a bar room, uh-huh. and an elephant's uh-huh. fart is a bar room. That's the difference. Okay, so you can check out uh, Jen Brisman singing "Open Fart Policy" on the uh, on the YouTube's. Give it a search; you'll enjoy it. <laughs> baroom is is that is that like is that like a Philly word for fart? You've never heard baroom before. It's a sound effect. Baroom. I mean, I've heard it, but I've never associated it with farts. Well, it's just to to liken it to bar room. Baroom. It's uh, no, I know. I, I like I an elephant it. would fart big and loud. Like a bar I'm room. sure that it would. Oh, okay. All right. That's a great dad joke. I don't know what you're saying. Comment down <laughs> below. Good joke, bad joke. Let me know. <laughs> Come on. Okay. All right. Oh my god. I'm doing? so sorry, everybody. Trivia, uh, trivia. No, we have to talk. We have. We haven't even talk, set up the episode yet. Oh yeah. Okay. My bad. Oh my god. All right. So this episode, whew, Deep Space Nine, Ooh. season two, episode twenty-one, the McKee part. Who was directed by Corey Allen, who last directed Paradise and written by future showrunner, showrunner coming up in about six episodes, Ira Stephen Bear, with a story by old showrunners Rick Berman, Michael Piller, Jerry Taylor, and Ira Stephen Bear. So we this is like almost a little bit the beginning of the of the turning of the ship. Mm. Because as we mentioned before. Uh, Star Trek Voyager was deep in development, and and so uh, Michael Pillar and Jerry and I think was it Berman Pillar and Taylor or just Berman and uh, and Taylor who went on uh, to focus exclusively on Voyager, essentially leaving Iris Stephen Bear to take over the ship. Um, so uh, there's a lot of pieces of this episode which start to feel tonally more like later nine. Um, because they handed it off to mm-hmm. Ira Stephen Bear, uh, our 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 loyal, our our not not our loyal, our our captain. You okay, forward. buddy? You smell toast? Hey, you know, <laughs> Mike's salty today. <laughs> we haven't recorded since Friday, so Mike's uh, Mike's all fired lonely. up. Yeah, <laughs> lonely, Mike. If you're lonely, you should be nice to people. Because people want to oh, hang out with you. Baroom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and there's no better transition to trivial trivia, Mike. <laughs> Jen, Jen, come here. CEO Jen, come here. All right, I hold on. Do we need to? <laughs> Jen, baroom is a, is a word for loud sound effect, right? Like an elephant fart being a baroom is not crazy, is it? No. Come on, camera, say that to the camera. But but hold I mean, on. I... Do you have to... Hi, Jen. Hi. <laughs> 
mean, I only know it in the context of the joke. The but room is not a sound for fart. It's just a loud noise. Yeah, but that's what a fart is, Keith. <laughs> no, a fart is a specific yeah, loud uh, noise. Thank you, Jen. Okay, okay. Yeah. Folks, I mean, you don't need a specific fart sound. Okay. What do we say? It's got to sound like a fart. I could also say like, blah, 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 blah. That's loud. Now it's keep fart waste noise. your time oh, God. with <laughs> trivial <laughs> trivia. This is a weird episode already. <laughs> we, we, this has gone weird and we're, we're still in trivial trivia. I know. We're in trouble. What a mess. All right. So uh, here we go in trivial trivia. Just a couple things this week. Uh, Ivor Stephen Bear, previously mentioned, wanted Hudson to die in this episode, but it was vetoed by Michael Piller. But Piller later regretted the veto. Uh, mm. Piller would leave Deep Space Nine to create Voyager after the season, leaving Ivor Stephen Bear free to kill off whomever he damned pleased. Moving forward, sort of mentioned that. Uh, and the second part of Trivial Trivia. To, uh, to do the Odo pulling a dude off of a ladder effect, they actually had to write special software to develop that shot, uh, which is crazy to me. Like, uh, But, you know, again, it was just the early, early days of CGI. There was no, like, just grab a goop thing over there, which we could do on our iPhone now. But back then, you had to actually write specific software to do it. Be very curious to see what the coding was on that. Uh, but impressive amount of effort just to do that effect. Mm. Which Deep I now have space my space nine, nine, come I said to Keith, but he's, but gotta, he's pretend gotta pretend, pretend I did it. It. I mean, no, I don't have it. That was that was CGI'd into my hands. <laughs> yeah, because our CGI is so good. Um, it's actually not bad. Keith, part two of the McKee has a fascinating conversation in which Quark one-ups a Vulcan on the subject of logic and the first the first appearance in Star Trek of a Car Cardassian with an atypical physique. We were afraid that the Cardassians were all becoming too alike, says Iris Stephen Bear. We wanted to see a kind of pear-shaped Cardassian just to show that they're not all alike. Okay, pear-shaped, I'm not sure that that held up, but, you know, I see, what, I, I see where you're going. I mean, I'm kind of pear-shaped. I hold up. <laughs> From console down. Uh, <laughs> as always is the case with one director picks up an episode from precisely the point of a previous director. Uh, part two's director, Corey Allen, had a conversation with part one's director, David Livingston. Primarily, they went over blocking for the characters as the episode opens. From that point, Allen was on his own. One of his challenges was attempting to put some visual interest in a lengthy six, six script page dialogue sequence between Cisco and Cal Hudson in the teaser. Alan's solution was to send them on a long walk and talk through the jungle. I know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know that it always works to walk talk a scene, says Alan, but it's a pretty staple trick, so we just put it on its legs. Kira's previously all negative feelings about Dukat begin to show some ambivalence here, as she is forced to begin seeing him as the multifaceted being he is. That was the beginning of their whole complicated relationship, which would become more and more complicated during the third and especially fourth season. The creator of Star Trek had frequently postulated that the Earth that both Kirk and Picard knew was a paradise, with no poverty, crime, or war. While Burr took care, Bear took care not to contradict that view, he began having the characters take a closer look at it, as when Sisko points out that it's easy to be a saint when in paradise. I've been wanting to say that line in Star Trek for a long time, says Bear. We need to dig deeper and find out what indeed life is like in the 24th century. Is it paradise? Or are there, as Harold Pinter supposedly said, weasels under the coffee table? Yeah. Oh, Pinter. Good reference. Uh, yeah. I mean, I I love exploring that idea. And boy, are we going to get into that. Um, there's a, you know, the, the idea of it's easy to be a saint in paradise and what happens when that's challenged or what happens when that's threatened is going to be something uh, we're going to deal with moving forward. And it's going to be incredibly prescient for a pre 9 11 show. Okay. All right. So uh, what was next generation doing? Well, let me tell you what they were doing. They were doing an episode called bloodlines in which Picard races a Ferengi in an effort to track down the son. He never knew he had uh, an episode that I did not remember. I rewatched it um, just because I was like, huh? 
uh, not very memorable. That's why I don't remember it. It's sort of a it's a it's a sequel to a season one episode, but it ended up not being that memorable. The guest stars here back on Deep Space Nine include Tony Plana as Amoros, John Shuck as Parn, uh, the the Carda- the prefer the uh, the aforementioned pear shaped um, Cardassian, the Cardassian of a certain shape. Uh, however, John Shuck, boy, has he done a lot of Trek. He plays a Klingon ambassador in Star Trek Four and Six, the movies. He was on Voyager as chorus member number two in Muse and Antac on Enterprise on two episodes, Affliction and Divergence. We also have the return of Natalia Nogolich as Admiral Necheyev, uh, who was previously seen on The Next Generation. So we have a little bit of a crossover here with The Next Generation. Uh, and if you remember, Mike, when she uh, guest starred on The Practice, I was like, oh my God, it's Admiral Necheyev. Yeah, yeah, totally remember that. We also <laughs> have Bernie Casey back as Calvin Hudson, Michael Bell as Drofo Awa, uh, Amanda Carlin as Cobb, and of course, Mark Alimo as Gal Ducat. Mike, let's go into the screening room. Shall we, Keith? I'm so glad they said sure. pear-shaped and not fatassian. There's a lot of silence there. A lot of silence. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Don't don't do a podcast with salty Mike. I'm telling you. It's not good. You prefer savory Mike? Yeah. Savory Mike. I I prefer savory Mike. Yes. All right, so here in the teaser, we find as we finished part 1, Cisco and the team are held at gunpoint before Hudson decides to be buddy buddy again. He hands Cisco his Starfleet uniform. Already, I'll say the ball is so dropped but in the conf- there's no conflict between these two men. The whole episode is supposed to be them squaring off, but at no point do you, they never you never fear like they have a chance to blow each other up, they have a chance to fight. They they must go way back because they do absolutely nobody wants to hurt the other person. There's that whole scene we'll get to later where like they open the doors in the during the like community council meeting and the whole terrorist group is there but he's like ah, just blast them but then send them back to their ship like i don't know that's weird i mean we have more conflict between us in this true. episode than that's 100 100 percent. oh god that's great yeah no anyway he hands his cisco his starfleet uniform and he's traded it in for the all-important maquis earth tone vest uh, they re rack the story from the first episode, and Hudson sure says the Federation treaties are useless on the frontier, and that Cisco has sided with the Cardassians. Three quarters of the budget of this episode went into smoke and dry ice, which does nothing to mask the soundstage of it all, despite how much they wander around the few feet of forest set. Uh, yeah, I just don't like. I understand they want to like save money, but like, can't you find an actual forest? Can't you go to Griffith Park and like walk around with like a real tree? Yeah, well, I could think this whole scene. I was like, yeah, that basically sums up the first episode, eh, rendering the first episode completely unnecessary. Yeah, yeah, it is re-racked. I think more effectively in that first two minutes than the entire first episode. Yeah, because this episode is better clearly because they can put all oh, the yeah. action in it, but. Uh, the whole time I'm thinking, why? What did we do last week? Do we even need it? I guess not. Well, no, no. There it is. So Hudson accuses again the Cardassian government of arming the Cardassian settlers. They finish their stroll right where they started, and Cisco says Hudson doesn't want peace; he wants revenge. Cisco drops Hudson's uniform into the dry ice. Then Hudson stuns Cisco, Kira, and Bashir. Pew, pew, pew. Uh, leaving them lying there in the dry ice. Which, which is sucks. not safe. Yeah. It's not safe because that stuff eats oxygen. Um, 
quick story, yeah, please, because I, I, I won't mention the actress's name because <clears throat> I think it's badass, but I want to I want to put her on blast. So I was doing a production of a, a very small show, but they were doing it with like a budget that was even too big, so they were just spending money on crap. They, they, it was this huge light plot for a very small show, and they were lighting it like a rock concert. There's all this smoke and all these lights and stuff, whatever. Now during tech, did, did it? Was this the musical that also had to do with pear shaped people? No, no. This was no, uh, okay. this was I love you perfect now change out in the Midwest, and very small theater, but it didn't didn't need to be as none of that matters. So actors during this tech process generally just sit there and just stand there and they light and smoke around you, but they 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 d- just in, they refused to let us leave while they were. They wanted the lights to match in the haze, and so they just kept pumping haze, 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 which is ostensibly mm-hmm. dry ice. And that stuff will dry you out. It's just not pleasant to be breathing in and out for like four hours of just constant haze. And so finally, this one actress who had like all these Broadway credits who was in our show was the nicest woman, incredibly talented, humble, but she threw her one diva fit because of the, because of dry ice. And she's like, she's like, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna call equity. And we're going to see what they have to think about this. You can either stop the haze, stop the dry ice, or you can find someone else to do my part. And she walked out. And I was like, wow. And that's, they, they shut that fog down right away. Well, it's interesting because there's there's two different things happening there, right? Because you've got the haze machine, which is like this this weird chemical smoke that goes everywhere. And I've, I've used it before. Um, did a great music video for Mike Calls and Sick, not you, Mike from I Got Fired, uh, using one of those. Um, but then the dry ice is the stuff that sits on the very bottom there, which is from um, like the, the the super cold ice. Anyway, and that's the stuff that actually like takes ox- oxygen out of the atmosphere because it's, it's like the CO2, I don't know, some sort of science, science, science. Um, I'll, I'll tell another story off topic. So my older brother in high school was doing a production of Star Mites if you'd believe it. I don't think um, I know what that is, actually. Oh, it was a it, it was a, an, an ill-fated Broadway rock musical. Um anyway, he was playing the bad guy and at the end of the end of the play he like falls into the pit of whatever and it was filled with dry ice. Well, they didn't use the dry ice until the opening night of the show. And of course our drama director was not like captain responsible. And uh my brother realized as he fell into the pit, he has to lie there for like the last 15 minutes of the show. And they just kept pumping. So he's lying down in this vat of dry ice. Like, I'm literally going to die. That's amazing. So, well, anyway. I mean, not, not him dying, of course, but. Yeah, well, he, he made it. He yeah. made it. He's fine. Uh, anyway, uh, where were we? Well, we got blasted. And then, yeah, let's and then beamed back one. on board? Yeah, let's, well, well, yeah, because it was they just stunned him so they could get away. They, they weren't going to try to kill him. So in Act 1, they arrive back at the station, and bigwigs from both the Federation and Cardassia are already on their way. Admiral Nechev is already dumping on Odo, um, filling in some of the backstory from that got cut from Episode 1. She says the Federation should never have left the colonists in the Cardassian side of the DMZ. Probably true. She asks what Hudson thinks, but he doesn't give up his buddy. Cisco does not tell them that Hudson turned. Cisco then gives a terrific speech uh, that Ivor Stephen Bear has been trying to get into Trek since Next Gen, which is like you said, and here it goes. The trouble is Earth, Kira says. Really? He says, on Earth there is no poverty, no crime, no war. You look out the window of Starfleet headquarters and you see paradise. Well, it's easy to be a saint in paradise, but the McKee do not live in paradise. Out there in the demilitarized zone, all the problems haven't been solved yet. Out there, there are no saints, just people. Angry, scared, determined people who are going to do whatever it takes to survive, whether it meets with the Federation approval or not. That's my cold read for Cisco. Uh, Kira says, that makes sense to me. And it kind of makes sense to me, too. And she's like, go tell the other guy. And he's like, maybe I'll do just that. Maybe I will. Uh, Odo calls and says, uh, hey, I caught one of the Vulcan's accomplices. Now, if you remember, the Vulcan was one of the people who abducted Dukat in the last episode. And the accomplice, of course, is Quark. 
Cisco says, no nonsense. What kind of business uh, were you in with her? And Quark eventually just gives up the ghosts and says she was buying weapons. Yeah, and here's a spreadsheet. Uh, here's a printout. Here's a spreadsheet of a ridiculous amount of weapons. So uh, they don't Cisco have any. Was, they don't have any authority to like hold him as an accomplice to stuff, or they just decide he's better as an informant. Like, why does he never face consequence? That is a very good question. And this one of all the, I mean, he's like. Look, I didn't do the direct selling. I just set up the meeting with a person who could do the selling, and yet somehow he knows all about which weapons. Like, why would he know that? Uh, but yeah, the accountability of of Quark, uh, we we get a lot. We let Quark get away with a lot. But I guess like he's the station is Bajoran, so it would go under Bajoran law, not Federation. Um, so there's a lot of like jurisdictional questions there. But yeah. I think there should be some consequences for yeah. Quark literally being an arms dealer. He's got a good lawyer, uh, man. He's got that John Larroquette representation. He sure does. Uh, oh, yeah, we've, we've talked about that. I watched the first two episodes. Uh, I, yeah, okay. A friend Here's, of mine's on it. Come on. Yeah, dude, I know, and I love Larroquette, but I just, Mike's sensibilities has evolved past network comedy. Well, it's very throwback. It's very network comedy. Yeah. Is very network. Anyway, whew, focus. We suck. We, we are not focused no, today. No. Uh, Case of the Mondays. Quark, Quark tries to get himself out of it by saying, I'll testify against anyone. Uh, but it seems like there's a ticking clock. Uh, so when Odo asks, How long to hold on to Quark? Cisco says sensibly, Forever. Then the Cardassian bigwig shows up and demands to speak to Cisco. And he says, here it is, Dukat was part of a group of misguided Cardassian leaders who were indeed secretly funneling weapons to the Cardassian settlers. And they don't want him back, and they assume the Maquis are going to execute him. Not a great day for Dukat, but that chest plate looks awesome. I'll say this, Keith, because you know Ben knows better than that. Ben has inside information because him and Ducat have been having chatty chats. So mm -hmm. some would say that the high command here gets Duke caught with their pants down. Uh, indeed, indeed. Uh, so uh, this guy, uh, who was horribly fat shamed in the book, <laughs> says that the Cardassians have no intention of going back to war with the Federation. So they're going to throw Ducat under the bus and walk away. Now, however, uh, neither Kira nor Cisco believe anything that he said, except they do believe that the Cardassians are smuggling weapons into the DMZ, and Avery Brooks is bringing full talent badassery to his performance yes. this week. 100%. Uh, he is just like full badass Cisco in this episode, and I'm here for it. Later on ups, we hear that there are more reprisals breaking out in the DMZ, but O'Brien has plotted the course of the McKee ship that took Dukat. They think they dropped him off on one of five planets, so Cisco naturally heads off for a rescue despite Kira's protestations. Cisco responds, the Central Command wants him, meaning uh, Dukat, dead, that's reason enough, enough for us to want him alive, which makes sense. So we uh, begin Act 2 on a watery planet or a planet that the AI upscaling doesn't know what to do with. <laughs> Hot Vulcan has been trying to mind meld with Dukat. It's not working, and she's obviously frustrated. Dukat taunts her. He can block her with mental discipline. The Cardassians have amazing mental discipline and uh little vest guy is angry think Ducat, think, think about puppies uh, 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 think, about, <laughs> think about baseball whatever i gotta baseball. do think about baseball <laughs> uh, get it <laughs> ducat mocks their federation distaste for the torture he would be doing in their place uh, and I wrote down here, and this applies to the whole damn episode, Mark Alimo is fantastic here. Absolutely incredible. 
And because Avery Brooks is giving his 110 and Alimo is giving 110, we're getting a 220 episode. Every time they're on scene together, it's like pops and sizzles. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think that's uh, once I think once they saw what they had with my, this is the episode I think where we see oh Mark Galimo is special. He's not yeah. just like Cardassian baddie. This guy is amazing. Um, and they they also just like the two of them know how to just smirk between the lines and just like give yeah. you every bit of face. The other thing I learned in the companion, you pr- I didn't put it in the episode or in my 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 highlights because you guys probably all know this, but I found it fascinating that um, normally why they wanted to show the the pear shaped individuals because they generally have to cast people who are built like Mark Alimo because ninety six percent of their body is covered in this latex foam ninety six percent. And so they need really, he's like, Mark Limo has 0% body fat, and that's how we had to cast most of these people. We wanted to show that it could be done otherwise. Um, and they didn't think it was that successful, so they were like, they actually could, didn't continue casting <laughs> non-superhuman Cardassians. Well, there's there goes my chance to play a Cardassian. <laughs> well, you could, play, you, could, you could play a Cardassian with a podcast, because it's just... Shoulder up. <laughs> I, I could, I could, yeah, I could, a very meticulously and carefully cropped podcast. <laughs> like, yeah, if you want, ever want to know exactly the demarcation to where I start being embarrassed, look at the bottom of your screen. That is the exact line where I'm like, I'm not going to show that. Keith's always <laughs> like, I was dialing it in. I think he means the green screen, but what he means is his crop. <laughs> I'm it, a million percent. I'm a million percent talking about getting the crop right. Anyway, no crop tops for me is my point. Uh, so then Cisco, Odo, and Bashir show up with phasers to rescue Dukat. They hesitate to start shooting, so Dukat takes it on himself to start the fight by himself. Cisco and the doctor, for some reason, blast through all the Maquis who are holding phaser rifles because they apparently suck at shooting as much as they do torture. Uh, then Odo yanks Vest Guy off a ladder with his goo arm. Uh, you know, that's that's the thing. Like these, I, I mean, I, I guess these are settlers, not warriors or whatever, but like yeah. they just stand there. You know the old saying, Keith no line, no aim. No, yeah, that's exactly right. (laughs) Yeah, we've got some Star Wars rules. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah, that was terrible. Uh, But they yank him off the ladder. This guy's taking some pratfalls in two episodes. Oh, my God. Angry little vest guy. Uh, Cisco arrests everyone other than the the wee vest guy and tells him to go tell Hudson that he hasn't told Starfleet yet. I didn't snitch. And you can have your clothes back back. at any time. Yeah. And at this point, I wrote down, I should credit Vest Guy as Tony Plana, who has had a remarkable career as an actor, including playing Ignacio Suarez on Ugly Betty, and has 217 IMDb credits ranging from comedy to drama. However, this was not his shining moment. No. But uh, the episode's shining moment apparently is we're going to take this uh, uniform... uh, uniform symbolism and really whip you in the face with it oh yeah roll it up like a towel and just and like he dropped it into the dry ice he had to like wake up from being shot pick it back up and carry it put it it in a nice little like door of the explorer backpack which we'll see later if only keith if only you could predict that the episode will end with him either putting it back on or just incinerating it with a phaser we'll see which one well spoiler alert so in Act 3, back on the station, Ducat pours out some canar, which is really thick. Cisco enters to check on him. Ducat keeps trying to be buddy-buddy. He asks about the this trial. This seems excellently the... lit, P.S. Yeah. Well, all the, stuff the whole on the episode, yeah. great. Um, and, I, you know, talk about the canar being so thick. Like, I like it, right? Because, like, you – Star Trek all, like, will frequently play and make the – you know, the drink's like a weird, fancy color to make it be sci-fi. But I think, like, the thick, viscous fluid is, like, it's it's gross in, a I think, a very effective way. You know what Keith sounds like on two glasses of Kunar? Yep, boop, 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 boop. I tried to break that. Oh, right. So he, uh, he asks 
Cisco about the trial of the Maquis members they arrested. And he tells us that in Cardassia, the guilty verdict is already rendered before the trial begins. They just do show trials for the entertainment of their people. Uh, then Ducat asks the obvious question, why didn't the Cardassians rescue me? Then Cisco tells him that the Cardassians blamed him and he can look forward to his own show trial. Uh, this scene is chef's kiss because they both have these shit-eating grins because the leverage is seesawing back and forth. Mm -hmm. Like, Cisco just feeds out so much line as as uh, Ducat is chewing the scenery, yep. shit-eating grin because he's like, it's oh, this is, we, we do so great, blah, 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 blah. And you can tell even, you know, because in episode one, they do a really good job of showing how kind of duplicitous, how much... Uh, Ducat enjoys being a contrarian, right? He just like loves and setting enjoys, up the like, things. enjoys like needling for power. Yeah, and so here you don't even see it coming. Even when he's like, how come you rescued me? He, it's like he's walking right into it and doesn't even see it. And so the beat change, a lesser actor would play it huge. But yeah. the subtlety with the beat change here where he realizes, oh, they set me up. I thought you know, like they set me up and then do, and then and then Ben comes back in with his I can't wait for that show trial. Oh, it's so good the back and forth. Oh, it's it's amazing. Uh yeah, I wrote much the similar thing. Uh, Ducat realizes that once he uh that he was always going to be blamed by the government for losing the station. So this goes back to the end of the occupation. This is it. And this is the face. That was his big yeah, change, but you could tell. That's exactly right. Yep. I said I wrote that once again Alimo is phenomenal he's in a desperate position but works to hide it he uh, offers to help cisco stop the cardassian arms smuggling if cisco helps him stop the maquis and perhaps have this have his position in the cardassian government look at the these three rescue. screenshots here it's a deal right boom realizing offering yeah. submitting i mean it's just like great masterclass. It, it's it it really is in in nonverbal acting in playing against you know having having your your reality be different from what you are saying playing the intention showing vulnerability while desperately trying not to show vulnerability which is one of the hardest things to do as an actor and I, go ahead I was just gonna say like compare you know go <laughs> do the work for me go compare a lot of the screenshots of Garrick who's doing a different type of facial acting. Effective, but completely different than what Alimo's doing here. Both really powerful, but different tactics, different and, different acting styles. And it's different tactics in subversion. Mm -hmm. They're both lying to you. Work, working very hard, but, but Garrick is better at hiding his emotions than Ducat is. And that is, again, it's good writing and it's good acting because that is true not of the actors but of the characters. And we learn something about Ducat here and that, that Ducat does have vulnerability. Um, and then this is the beginning of Ducat becoming one of the more interesting characters on the entire series. Uh, three, uh, two notes I made too. Um, there are three shots in this episode. There, I thought the episode was framed and set up really well. And by setups, I mean it's establishing shots and the way where the camera is put and kind of where it's viewing to see the actors and such. Right. And um, I think this episode is so excellently shot up and framed or set up and framed. There are three screenshots per in particular that I think are beautiful because of the way that they are shot on the show. And this is one of them because you had this face off slash this moment where they're coming together. And you notice the two screenshots here. Right, so it's, yeah. they're each in a corner third, looking at each other the same way, shadowed the same way, basically showing an equal power in this dynamic, which I think is really cool. And and yet, it's belied in Alimo's eyes mm -hmm. because you can see he's not crying, but he's a little misty. And that's the only part of his face that belies his emotion. It just calibrating that amount of moisture eye moisture in your eye is phenomenal acting there it is boom yeah it's just oh, you know now they're so scaled good. the same they're lit and framed the same it's really great stuff oh it's, just such it's good stuff. stuff fantastic it, it it is 
And then the final, Great. so I don't forget the final yeah. shot of the episode. I think I have a shot of it, but that that too have just been. We'll talk scale then too, because Ben, as you can see, a lot of the hero shots he shot in a lot of hero shot this episode. Both of them yeah. are, in fact, which is like yeah. really big and usually an up shot, so they seem larger than life. They are above it all. But in that last scene, they I love they they do closing shots a lot. We'll see when we get there. But Ben is center of the frame, but it's very pulled back. He's very small, and there's a lot of negative space. We'll get there. Yeah, it's it's just it's great. Uh, so in the in that scene, Ducat even makes a point to thank Cisco for rescuing him, and I think it's genuine. Well, and then Cisco's re- retort: "You'd have done the same?" Question mark. No, I wouldn't. Have. It's, I mean, the again, power, 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 power. It's great. Uh, so and 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 that like who has the upper hand power thing is going to happen for the rest of the series. Well, one thing I love about Cisco and the kind of freedom they've built into him, because you never saw, you never really, you know what Picard was almost devoid of? Sarcasm. Mm. When he yeah, said never. something, it's never. what he meant, right? He was, yeah. he was, it, it, there was barely any subtext with him. It was pretty much right there. It was very Shakespeare, right? Shakespeare didn't write between yeah. the lines. He put it on the page. He just gave it verse. Yeah. Not Cisco, baby. Like, there's always seven layers to what Cisco's saying, and you kind of are left to figure it out based on context and where you think he's at. It's cool. It's different. 100%. 100%. Uh, and, and I think that's a really great observation about the difference between Cisco and Picard. Um, sarcasm. I, I, I hadn't thought of that, but what, now that you said that, like that is a million percent true. Uh, all right. So later in the staff meeting, uh, it's in full swing, including Ducat. Odo explains that the Maquis got an insane amount of weapons from Quark, enough for a full assault on Cardassia, which I'm not sure about that, but that's what they said. Uh, and they're going to stage a large attack. 20 photon torpedoes? That's a lot. They're they're big, right? I mean, they're powerful. It's And they're, and they're sort of mounting these cannons onto small ships. It, it, I, I think mounting a full attack must be like on the target, not on Cardassia. Mm-hmm. There's no way. Um, but they are trying yeah, they're just to trying up. to like a weapons depot they're going after, it's right? A, yeah, they're going after a weapon depot. Uh, and Ducat tells them who is smuggling for the Cardassians. It's the Zeppelites. So they take a runabout to chase down a Zeppelite freighter that Ducat thinks is smuggling weapons. They try to inspect the ship, but the captain says, nah. Are these then, miniatures they're shooting? Um, at this point, yes. Yeah. Okay. I think so. Because it looks, they look great. It does not look CGI. No, it lo- it looks terrific. Um, we're, I, I don't know exactly when in the series they switch from miniatures to digital, um, but I think it's pretty seamless. I don't, I don't think I, I clocked when they switched. Um, so uh, they try to inspect the ship. The captain says no. Then Ducat steps up and alphas the situation. The Zeppelite captain is terrified of Ducat and lowers the shields. Cisco is obviously tickled by this. Um, so we only see the Zeppelite on a screen, but um, amazing makeup, mm-hmm. as usual. Uh, <laughs> more shoulder pads, but whatever. Um, but, the, but you know, of course, he's, it's an interesting situation for Ducat because he holds all this power as a Cardassian, as being a high-level Cardassian. So this guy's confused why he's working with the uh with the federation because he doesn't know that they've turned on ducat yet so uh but they thus are able to prove that they were uh t- carrying weapons from the cardassian government so in act four we uh we go to the brig and quark and the hot vulcan are chatting quark says i empathize with your position oh, I I for- hold on sorry sorry keith rewind so he, after Ducat throws his weight around here, uh, I love this this take right before we go to the next act because it's a definitely like a I still got it. Oh yeah, so good. I mean the the whole Ducat's like whole like identity at this point is wrapped up in little exertions of power, little power plays. What what can I what how can I dominate one way or another? That's how he gets his satisfaction. Uh, like certain political leaders we've been become familiar with. And it's it's really, it's really interesting here. You know, first of all, this is the first week where the companion sort of spoiler alerted me, which kind of bugged me. 
um, mm. because it it foreshadows that in season five, Ducat goes real bad. Um, and by foreshadow, I mean it just says it, uh, which pisses me off because here I'm like, oh, I love maybe for the rest we're going to have Ducat and Ben come back together all the time every once in a while to kind of work between the lines with each other inside that gray area between right and wrong. Yeah. You know, fixing uh, – and that, it, I've been so compelled by their partnership here. It's – although that same – being setting up the potential friendship might actually make the antig- antagonism later more juicy. So we'll, well see. And, like, and yeah, that sucks. But also I'll say that we ask the question – Forever. Okay. It never really gets solved. Okay. Um, so uh don't 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 be too swayed by that. Cool. Uh all right. So so we go, yeah, we're in act four of the brig, uh, Quark and the hot Vulcan are chatting. Quark says, I empathize with your position as the as a McKee member, but it's illogical. The third rule of acquisition is never spend more for an acquisition than you have to. He says that their objective is to acquire peace, and you're paying too much for it. The Cardassians have been caught red-handed, so no more weapons will get in. And at this particular moment, both sides are equally matched, so the price of peace is low. Attacking the Cardassians will only escalate the conflict and make peace more expensive. Uh, and I wrote in Iris Stephen Bear's writing here is excellent. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so is Odo's explained. costuming. Quarks? Quarks, excuse me. Yeah. I mean, I, I think Iris Stephen Baird did such a better job of explaining this situation in a couple of paragraphs than the entire first episode did. I walked out of that like, wait, what? They're doing who and the why? And and he's able to do this all in two paragraphs. He's a good writer. We're going to find out more about that later. So later, Cisco and Dukat discuss what the hot Vulcan just confessed, the target of the Maquis attack. There is a secret Cardassian weapons depot hidden among civilians, but they don't know where it is. Dukat says, don't tell the Central Command, I'll find out where it is, making himself useful. In the meantime, Cisco is going to go negotiate with the Maquis back on their settlement. So he heads off and uh, finds the settlement doodad. Now it's nighttime. Mm-hmm. They adapted the the same matte painting for night. Uh, they're having a meeting. And School Cisco board meeting. shows up. School board meeting, yeah. right? Uh, and uh, Cisco comes up and he speechifies that they should call off the attack. Because if they do attack, they will be enemies of the Federation. Uh, then a bunch of folks with phasers show up, including Hudson. And this is when we continue the uniform of it all. He, uh, he offers backpack, him backpack. He offers him a family pack filled with a Starfleet uniform, and he says, "Now that they've stopped the Cardassian weapon, weapon shipments, there is no need for the Maquis." Hudson says, "Nope," but join me. Cisco says, "Nope." I really did a good job rewriting that scene. Hudson zaps the uniform as if the symbolism isn't strong enough. <laughs> Photoshop. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Zero. I don't know what setting it is to vaporize a uh, a knapsack <laughs> filled with a uniform, but he but, nailed but it. But to stop there, right? Like, don't right, go through and, not, and hit Ben's penis. Right. Don't hit Ben's little Ben. It's not good. <laughs> More like Big okay. Ben. All right, moving on. Big Ben. So, uh, yeah, you know. In Act Five, this Ducat is the best. You can, has, here's how I know it's Photoshop. Because look at Ben; he doesn't move. Nobody moves. This is the same picture. <laughs> oh, that's so true. They took a still, animated on top of the still. Of course. Oh, good catch, Mike. Right. Look at the guy in the background. You know, does it's I mean, just it's, a still? It's, it's the same thing they do when you're beaming in or beaming out. Like, yeah. It's all the same thing. But that's, huh? Very clever. I call this screenshot. So, who farted? Who fought? <laughs> It was definitely Ducat. <laughs> I mean, it might have been Dax. He got you. Because Kira me. assumes Kira assumes it was Ducat, and Ducat's got the. Ugh. Yeah. I think it was Dax. I think mm-hmm. Dax farted. Curzon. That's who it was. So uh, Ducat has found out where the depot is. They need to stop the Maquis attack before the Cardassian government finds out about it. Otherwise, 
there will be a full-scale war. They're trying, they're going to try to stop them with their three little runabouts, which I have two thoughts on. Which, because on the face, is pretty ridiculous, considering the scale of this, the stakes of this. You're literally trying to stop a full-blown war between the Cardassians and the Federation, and you're going to send your two, like, three little toy ships? Is there not, like, a real Starfleet ship available to mm. do this? Mm. Devil's advocate. Uh, I would think maybe their plan was to keep it quiet, and so the Cardassians wouldn't know uh, that any of this happened, and the big old, you know, the Enterprise comes in, it's going to get their attention. So I can see both sides. So they set up in formation outside the colony, but there's nobody there yet. Then the ships arrive, the Maquis ships, and Cisco hails Hudson. It's a showdown. And uh, we see that the Maquis ships look way cooler than the runabouts. Yeah. They... Also, here's, I had a question, and I think maybe the answer is okay. like, but there's potential for violence in this journey, right? Clearly. Yeah. Would you bring your entire full staff? Like your bet your the cream of your crop people? Like, isn't there like a like, you know, uh Congress during the Speaker of the House or uh, the State of the Union kind of situation? Like, don't we want to leave at least somebody behind? A designated survivor. Yeah. It was Quark. Quark's a designated survivor. Oof, I mean, everybody? I mean, he has a lot of faith that his buddy old Cal isn't gonna blast them. Well, and you'd think they would have pilots and yeah. yeah it, don't they it, have like squadron any- leaders and stuff? Mike, they're series regulars. They're going to get paid either way. We might as well use. Is them. it possible that they're they're doing something they don't want Starfleet to know about? But they do. Starfleet's going to know. Starfleet is. Yeah, no. Starfleet it's a, it's knows an, it's about a, an it. aggressive maneuver, one way or the other. I, I, I think it's. I, I think this is a production issue. I, Worm I think it's like hole. It would make much more sense if you had like six nameless badass. Yeah. Like pilot oh, extras. Go, go red leader. Yeah, there's no there's no red leader. You have O'Brien, who's not a pilot. So, <laughs> and the doctor. And the doctor. They're, <laughs> they're gonna do great pew pew. Yeah, they get knocked out within thirty seconds. Oh, of course they do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we the we the, the Maquis ships show up. They look way cooler. Uh, they hit the Maquis ship with a tractor beam, but of course it starts firing. The battle begins. Pew pew. Both sides do damage and knock out the other ships, so it's just Cisco versus Hudson. Uh, the pew pews here look fantastic. Yeah, great pew pews. I think this is the best ship battle on TV Trek we've <laughs> seen. Except, no, th- this guy, he there were no stakes for him either episode. Like, I'm not putting him in, I'm sure he's a great actor, a lot of but not he did not bring if a if Cisco brought 110, he's giving me a solid 30. He just he never got hype. He's never angry. He's never feels in any danger. When his ship gets shot and they don't, he's like, nah, sorry, I guess I'm going to. And then when he gets put, the screws get put to him here at the next scene, he's like, yeah, okay, I'm going to just flee. <laughs> no urgency, just nothing. He, he's he stone did cold. not go to the Shatner school mm. of acting. No. Uh, he, he, he would have been like, gone. So, uh, but I do think That's this shot cool. right here. Yeah. I love so it's it's almost like they mounted a camera on top of it and we took the ship's point of view. That's a this is a pew pew angle we have never seen on track before. And uh it's definitely video game style, better maybe. than than we've ever seen. Um and hold on to your butts, kids. Um but I but I was like, that's the best ship battle I've seen um on TV track, not the movie track, the movie's different. But anyway, Hudson tries to make a run for it. And Cisco tells him to stand down and tells him, you're going to be an outlaw. Ducat naturally wants him to fire, but Cisco won't because uh, they were their buddies. But their friendship is over. And they leave it at that. But they do stop the attack. Later, Cisco it is, is in his office and Kira comes in to say Ducat has left. Cisco got a commendation from Starfleet, but he's not happy. He didn't prevent a war. He just delayed the inevitable. And on that mysterious note, we end the Maquis part. Well, they they give us the hero shot, right? But then they don't end the episode there, which is what I love. Here's the shot. Yeah. All that negative space. 
and just well, playing I mean, his baseball all, tiny in the frame. He's all alone on his Deep Space Nine with uh, so much responsibility and nobody there to help him. Like it's a whole, it's a whole thing. It's a beautiful shot. Great shot. I mean, the, the lighting on that is just perfect. Like that's uh, a. I would someone gave if I had a painting of that, I'd be all for it. Ooh, that's a great. That would shot. be an amazing painting. And all love, right, somebody I'd, out there. Yep. Uh, Mike Take likes negative shot. space. Yeah. Make a painting. Yeah. With the baseball and everything. The coolest. Uh, you want to know what's not cool, but we do it every week anyway? It's. No. Oh, no, Mike. <laughs> Don't forget your quiz, buddy. And now it's time for Mike and Deglio's Star Trek vocabulary quiz. All right. These, these two are easy. The yep. first one, because I don't think we've done it yet on Deep Space Nine. Mike, what's a mind meld? Oh. Uh, that's when uh, the hottest Vulcan puts her lovely hot fingers on your face and sees all the dirty, dirty things you're thinking. <laughs> okay, well, that is the horniest way you possibly <laughs> could have explained that. Uh, although, um, Not wrong. I forget, who, I forget who wrote it down. Uh, we forgot all about the hottest Vulcan. You haven't seen Enterprise yet, but that just made me uncomfortable. Hot. Uh, <laughs> we'll talk about that later. All right. So your second one is, uh, Mike, what's a Zeppelite? Uh, that's an Italian fried dough, Keith. They're little balls. You fry them up, mm -hmm. put some powdered sugar on them. Delicious. All right. Let's come along home. <laughs> no, wait. No, come on. You know... All right, here is when we hand out some awards and I probably recenter myself. There I am. Here we are at Quark's. Let's talk about uh, this episode. Were there any wormholes in the plot? Well, the first one for me has got to be that whole, um, the pilot thing. That, bu that bugs me. They should have pilots. It's weird they have your, like your best people all going to like clearly an off an offensive. Um, it's like sending uh, your, your all your generals to fight Desert Storm or whatever. It just doesn't make a ton of sense. Um, yes, I, I I will try to. I mean, I guess it. if you're trying to keep it, I, I don't know. Go ahead, and make it make sense. Well, I I think the only thing that really helps make that make sense is realizing how much of a skeleton crew they have on deep space nine yeah. it's not it's not a federation station you don't have 300 people to choose from i mean i think they only have like 15 20 30 federation officers on the station at this point and most of them are junior officers and so these are these are your most experienced people uh it doesn't it, it doesn't make a heck of a lot of sense but i think when you realize how like how you know the the skeleton crew and sort of how alone out in the middle of the universe they are a little bit. They don't have a huge security force. The security force on the station is Bajoran. So maybe that helps. Maybe it doesn't. Right, what and else you and then secondly, I would say, and this is a tough one because we talked about how Ben does live between those lines. But you know, when Dax went off to potentially murder that person with the Klingons, Ben didn't say mm -hmm. much, right? Uh, and I guess they let Quark off the hook a lot, but his his buddy has clearly done a lot of bad things here. His buddy is arming a, a, a terrorist resistance. He kidnapped Dukat. He kidnapped, almost kidnapped Ben and his crew. He blasted upon them. I mean, he did enough bad stuff, and Ben just like let him go. Yeah, I mean the Quark Quark's argument would be, um. You know, I didn't. So his, I can buy. His, I can buy Quark. It's 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 Cal. It's letting Cal escape when they had every Cal they escape. had every intention. They had every ability right there to capture him. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, they they def well did they or were they both sort of dead in the water? I don't I don't particularly remember. But I no, think because they, he had to throw Ducat down because I guess his only option was to blast. He couldn't uh, capture. Right. Him. I I think there. I think it was like we literally kill him or let him go. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, 
it's it's a it's a tough call, right? Because like you know, at some point you're gonna turn on the Federation and you're gonna you know try to try to blow up New Jersey, mm-hmm. and I'm gonna be like, Mike is not worth it, and I I think I would give you one chance to get away before I kill you. Didn't he do that a couple times already this episode? <laughs> Yeah, he did. Okay. Well, maybe give him a couple. I guess he likes you. He likes Tim better than I like you. Okay. Maybe that's it. Fair. You get one, Mike. You get one time right. to overthrow New Jersey. Okay. <laughs> good. That's good to know. Yeah, I, I yeah. think I'd get at least three, but just one. Okay, keep it in your it. pocket. Just, just right. one, buddy. All just right. one. What about you? Any wormholes here? Um, no. I mean, I, I am a little bit confused as to why Quark gets away with it. Right, that doesn't make any sense. But uh, it, it. I mean, he's he's not the guy who did the arms deal, but he clearly set it up. He was a part of but it. But he is deep throat that keeps deep throating, right? Like it's he's well, not. Sure. He's like the best informant, but he just he he's useful. No, and and I, I I think that is why they put up with it because he is useful more often than not. They mm-hmm. they ha- they know more because he's there then you know and maybe that's worth more than the shenanigans he gets up to but he gets up to some pretty dark shenanigans yeah, that's fair uh i mean at, at at some point even though the person responsible for killing a bunch of people is giving you great intel you have to like draw the line somewhere um anyway uh yeah no i mean that's uh, that's it i mean i think i understood the stakes of the maquis in the situation a little bit better this time um that i did before and it's a you know it's it's hard to i I think it's working really hard to make the motivation or make the like the side of right kind of murky Mm -hmm. but i don't think it necessarily is um so i don't know it's eh, there was it didn't blow that up to me and like no that's it i think that's all i really had it all sort of made sense to me all right Let's talk about our best moments. Let's do it. Um, I think you just can't get better than that scene with the two of them. Uh, yeah. Just where the p- balance of power is shifting between du- and Ducat's realizing that he's maybe fallen out of favor with the high command. It's just there's so much good acting and and face and just like verbal, nonverbal acting, acting, acting. The, yeah. the the whole nine it's just it's excellent and the two of them just show you know and ben has been for a good portion of this season kind of saddled on the side so having him kind yeah. of come back has been really awesome and he's really gave two excellent performances so that scene i think is the one yeah i i, I don't think i'm gonna put an alternate out because i think you're i think you're right i think it's i think it's more than just that scene it is the the moment cisco tells ducat that the government turned on you Mm-hmm. And him realizing they're going to execute me, and it's that moment and the five seconds after, while while we see that register on Mark Alimo's face, him feel it and hide it simultaneously. So good. That fifteen seconds was the best part of this of this episode. Obviously, totally. Uh, all right. Let's hand out some self-sealing stem bolts, which uh, I was just watching an episode from season three of Discovery. Get a shout out on season three of Discovery. We get a name check of self-sealing stem bolts. I was very excited. So, you know, in big picture, what I think this episode and this this arc does, aside from whatever, you know, benefit it plays in Voyager and such, is it truly lets us know that and we've had other episodes like this, but this is the first time where Ben was in, was in charge of what was of the goings on and the stakes and such. That we're gonna sometimes handle problems and make decisions that are outside the quote unquote universal ideal, right? Whereas Star mm-hmm. Trek, in my experience prior to this, has always been much more than Star Wars or other sci-fi. Like we do things by the book. By the book. And it's righteous, and it's always that way. And even when we have to make a sacrifice where it's painful, we do the right thing. But here, we're letting allies get away with some shady business. We're using some shady or underhanded methods to get what we want. We're rescuing the bad guy. We're teaming up with the bad guy or the the gray area guy. 
and and Ben is and Ben is using sarcasm and enjoying a little bit of wordplay and enjoying a little bit of power dynamic, all kinds of stuff that is just so juicy. And it really f- fleshes him out. I love Captain Picard, don't get me wrong. Uh, and But Ben, so far, and probably because I'm watching it <laughs> co- correctly, th- you know, consistently and throughout, it feels so much more three-dimensional. And I love the fact that where I start, you remember, where I started with Ben was not particularly favorable, even to Avery Brooks. I was like, what is this? Yeah. Somehow it's all clicking for me here in season two and knowing where that we're going somewhere great with him, apparently, uh, is is awesome. So this episode really sets that up a lot, really well. And it, it's cool that Ben's moving the chess pieces. It's clear that Ben's moving the chess pieces and sometimes they ain't moving them in the right spot. Like, hey, maybe ain't go by the rule book. And I like that. Uh, now, that all said, the first episode was rendered completely unnecessary. Uh, which mm-hmm. is fine because really all it served to do was set the table, but then like set a big, oh, they kidnapped or whatever. the kidnapping plot was uh, all that's foiled so quickly. It was just a bridge, but it was also a bridge to a new director and basically showrunner. Right. So, yeah. And I think maybe this is symbolic of where we're headed because I thought this episode was much more successful, much more grounded, better written. I mean, there's some great dialogue in the first one, but this was just a better over better shot. It's a good episode. Uh, great episode? No. Uh, but just to get the Alimo and Avery Brooks scenes, uh, I, I'll yeah. take it. So what did I give last week? Last week you gave it a 68. Oh, okay. Yeah. This, I don't want to crack into the 80s because I don't think the episode or even the arc was that particularly interesting to me. But the performances and the the vibe established – uh, was great. And it tech on a technical level, this is one of the best episodes. I mean, what they did with the money, with the exception of a couple of things. Uh, I'm going to give it a solid 8 zero, 80, even. 8, eight zero. Yeah, well, I, I think you are, uh, I think you're really onto something about this episode exploring the gray areas. And and sort of putting Cisco in a position where he's having to make sort of personal calls a little bit outside of the Federation rules and regulations. And I think the reason for that is this is the one of the first times, as opposed to like one random wacky admiral, you know, like the like the the crazy bad admiral is like a trope on next gen. Every admiral we see is crazy and has turned dark or wrong or whatever. This is sort of the first time in the the DMZ and the negotiation and the McKee of it all. It's the first time we really see the Federation as a whole mm. showing some fallibility, showing some s- sloppiness or or lack of um, not lack of integrity, but just sort of like not having a good handle on a Politics, situation, basically. You, you you see politics, you see um, just decisions that aren't really well thought out and not a lot of sort of creativity in their thinking. And so we we see some fallibility in the Federation, which forces Cisco to have to make some of these judgment calls because doing it by the company line, well, the company line doesn't really make a lot of sense in this particular right. moment and is not going to be effective. More more than more than not making sense, it's not going to be effective at accomplishing what you want to accomplish because what you tried to accomplish didn't make a lot of sense. So mm-hmm. the, what you do to do it, it's... And so we're starting to see Cisco being forced to do some of his own thinking, do some of his own decision-making Cisco's idea of the greater good when neither side like there there are four sides in this conflict. You have the Cardassians, you have the Federation, you have the Cardassian settlers, you have the Federation settlers. And none of those four points are behaving in a particularly reasonable fashion or in a, in a in a fashion that's going to accomplish anything. So Cisco has to be the fifth point and try to like make the best of a bunch of bad options. And I think that that's part of why we see him so alone mm-hmm. at the end. It's like, I'm all by myself. I'm a fifth point in an intractable situation where I have very little power and yet all of the responsibility. 
Um, and that's what the Federation did. Federation screwed this all up, right? And then the Admiral comes in like to Cisco, eh, figure it out. Yeah. You know, we're gonna we're gonna, you know, it's it's your fault for screwing this up. No, he didn't. He's trying to clean up your mess. And I think that that um, is a very interesting dynamic here. Um, so, yeah, there are parts of this. The the, the McKee does, still does not feel threatening or particularly interesting at this point. Um, the Ducat Cardassian machinations, that was interesting to me. 100%. The, everything with Ducat in this episode was great. Um, his taunting of the McKee members, his being able to fight off the mind meld, fantastic. Everything about that was great. Um, so uh, as a result, it's a mixture of some really great stuff and some like, eh, stuff. Uh, but still, I think, pretty good and a marked improvement on part one. I'm going to give you 83 self-sealing stem bolts. So next week, we are watching The Wire. Okay. So uh, not not the HBO The Wire. Mm-hmm. Great. Uh, but, uh, Some people say the greatest show on television. So yeah. Well, this is this will be an interesting episode to talk about. Maybe some more Cardassian fun. We'll find out next week on Keith and Mike Watch Deep Space Nine. Uh, if you're listening to the podcast only version of this, please give us a rating and review on whatever your podcasting service is. We know th- there's a fair amount of folks listening to the podcast only, so you can really help us find more folks by uh, leaving us a rating and review, telling a friend, uh, some Helpful. other Niner out there uh, for sure. That would be very helpful. Check out, look at my Star Trek toys. Check out Keith and Mike play Star Trek, whatever, whatever. Uh, check out k and Geekly. We have so much nonsense. We are spouting onto the internet every week, more than I would care to keep up with. Uh, but you can find us here on the YouTube at Keith and Mike. And uh, you can join our Patreon at patreon.com slash k and Spell out that and and get, if you were like, ah, uh, I see this fire hose of content of your absolute nonsense. I want more of that and I want to pay for it. Patreon.com slash K and M. Uh, Mike, we're going to see you back here next week with Keith and Mike. Watch Deep Space Nine. Thank you for watching K and M Entertainment. If you enjoyed our particular brand of nonsense, please like and subscribe. Or become one of our patrons at patreon.com slash K&M.